Have you ever thought about what it would be like if God was to come and knock on your door? Have you ever thought about this? Why, why would God even do that? And what could we do to begin to invite God to do that, to knock at the doors of our lives? And so today, I want to share from Isaiah chapter 6. And so if you have your Bible or your Bible app, please turn there. Uh, I'm going to talk about when God comes knocking. And I pray that it will help you understand why God would want to seek you out. Why God would want to begin to knock at the door of your hearts. And why is it so important that God wants us to begin to prepare our hearts so that He can meet with us. And so this is something I believe is so important. And as we turn to this passage in Isaiah in chapter 6, we're going to look at verse 1 to 8 today. And this is a time where the prophet Isaiah had a tremendous encounter with God. One, one of the great encounters recorded in the scriptures for us. And uh, in that time, we can really discover four key reasons why God would want to knock on the door of your life. And so I want to share this with us. And, and for the first key we need to understand is that the reason why God wants to knock on your door is because God seeks your attention. When you look at verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 6, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne. You know, have you ever been relying on somebody for security? Relying on somebody for stability? Well, King Uzziah was a really good king. He was a very capable king. And of, but he did, make, he did make some mistakes in his, later in his life. And if you read the story of King Uzziah, you, you see what it is. But basically, he ruled well. And he honored God. And the nation, as a result of this king who ruled well and ruled wisely, the nation prospered. They prospered in so many different ways. And even the temple, the worship of the temple, the religious life of the people prospered because he chose to honor God. And so he did many great things. But then the time came, of course, when King Uzziah died. And when King Uzziah died, the prophet Isaiah, he was like, oh God, this has been a great king. What's going to happen? And so Isaiah probably was grieving deeply. And there was a time and a season that he began to cry out even to God even more about this whole situation. And in the midst of his crying out to God, God gave him this vision. God began to meet with him. And so God began to lift Isaiah's attention back to God. You see, Isaiah had put too much attention upon the king. He said, King Uzziah, such a great king. Thank you, Lord, for King Uzziah, King Uzziah, King Uzziah, yay. How many of us have seen some of this working out in the politics, say in the U.S., some of the people that voted certain presidents, I won't mention, because they were hoping... And so people's eyes were on some political leaders, and, and we can do the same thing. Our eyes can be on certain political leaders and say, yes, this leader will lead us out. And so the prophet Isaiah had this attention given to this king. But now God was lifting his eyes and say, and bring his eyes to the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And so God wanted Isaiah's undivided attention. Can somebody say amen? Amen. I believe God wants to speak to us as well. You know, when you notice what Isaiah was writing in Isaiah chapter 6, uh, Isaiah noticed so many details. Why was this? Why is it in this vision he remembered so much of this? That's because he knew that God had come knocking. I mean, the prophet Isaiah was not saying, oh, you know, I, well, this vision, maybe I just had too much pizza last night. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just seeing things. But that's not, that's not his attitude. He knew that God had come. He knew that God had come knocking uh, on his door. So the question is this, are we aware when God comes knocking? Do we recognize when God is knocking at our door? You see, God doesn't always come in lightning and thunder. God doesn't always come as, uh, the way Isaiah experienced it. Many times God comes in much more subtle ways. Many times God comes in a mere whisper and begins to whisper into our hearts and begin to speak to us. 
At times, it's just a, a subtle shift in the spiritual atmosphere. Are we aware that God has come to be with us? At times, uh, do we sense when, when God is, the presence of God is filling this place? And we, it's, it's almost like a, a, a light mist come upon you, except this mist, the presence of God just soaks through your very soul and it touches your heart. Or sometimes I've, I've felt the presence of God is like a, a little electric current that comes from head to toe coming down. And you're like, whoa, God is appearing. And so do we notice? Are we even aware when God has started knocking? It's like it's just a light one. Not like when Peter the other night, he came and he was bashing away at my screen, my security screen. And I'm like, who in the world is knocking so hard? <laughs> But many times God just comes and He's just, he's just stepping <laughs> upon our hearts. And what we need to do is we got to get into a God awareness mode. And really to do that, we, we need to come in prayer. Then we begin to tune in to God. We begin to, to focus in unto God. And it is at times of fasting. As I was mentioned just now, times uh, by Winnie, I believe she said, Prayer doesn't change God, but it changes our heart. And fasting, fasting helps us to prepare our hearts. You see, fasting turns us from worldly matters to heavenly matters. Can somebody say amen? When we fast and we pray, it helps turn our attention to God. So the question is this, are we committed to doing some of that? Are we committed to turning up and listening for God? Even in the midst of troubling times, in fact, when the times are most troubling, those are the times when we need to turn to God the most. Those are the times when we need to tune in to God. So when we think about it, are we turning up on Sunday? Are we turning up for God? Are we turning up to listen to Him? Are we turning up times of prayer? We just announced our prayer meeting. Are we tuning in? Are we locking in? Even if it's online, we're turning up and say, God, I want to spend some time because I want to be with you. I want to turn up and be ready for you. Will we seek God and seek to hear Him? We say, God, I'm waiting. I'm ready. I'm ready for you, oh God. You know, one of the things I'm really concerned about is when people turn up to church just to hear my sermon. I'm very concerned if you do that. Here I am, I'm the preacher. I'm the one delivering the sermon. But if you're, turns, if you're just turning in, turning up, tuning in just to hear me preach, I'm very concerned. Because it's the wrong way around. You see, worshiping God should be the highest priority. Can somebody say amen? amen. Hearing the sermon is a secondary, maybe even tertiary priority. So we should come to worship God as the highest priority. We should come to church not so much to receive first, but first to give honor and worship to God. That is the most important thing. Now, don't get me wrong. Do turn up for the sermon. <laughs> it helps us out. Some of us preachers too. We put in so much effort, you know, guys. But, <laughs> but the most important thing is turn up for the worship and then turn up for the sermon. How many say amen to that? Because we must remember it is God first that we're coming, not for ourselves, not for the sermons. You know, when you go to heaven, I'm not going to stand at the pearly gates and say, why didn't you, you turn up for my sermon? But God may be at the pearly gates and asking, why didn't you turn up to worship me? And so we need to get our priorities right before God and make the effort. Say, God, I want to come. I want to give unto you honor and worship, oh God. I want to give it to you first. You know, when I was a, a young believer, and of course, like many young believers, I, was, I had my struggles coming to church all the time. And I had a mate who actually came to Christ about six months before me. And uh, he was doing engineering as well. And, and so I asked him, I said, why? Why do you turn up to church? And because he was coming to church every Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday evening. And I was like, why do you do that? I was like, you know, Sunday morning, every Sunday is, whew, I mean, that's commitment, guys. Uh, that was what, how I was feeling as a young Christian. So I asked this guy, and he said, I turn up 
because I want to be there when God turns up. And I was like, whoa, I've never forgotten that. That, that really stuck with me. And uh, <clears throat> so the thing is this, will we turn up so that we are there when God turns up? And that, that attitude makes all the difference. You see, people who encounter God the most are the people who turn up, who turn up and wait on God, who turn up where God has been coming. They, they know, hey, whenever there's worship, when the people's hearts are for God, when the worship lives, God, that's when the presence of God comes. That's when the Holy Spirit begins to move. Ah, that's when God comes. God comes when there are times when people get away from the hustle and bustle of life, the times of camps and conferences and conventions where people put time aside and they're going to seek God, they're going to hear from God, they're going to cry out to God. Those are the times and the seasons when God tends to come more often. Whoa, I must be there. These are the ones who encounter God more because they keep turning up in the places where God does turn up. And so we need to understand this thing. See, the problem sometimes, I think, for all of us is we get too distracted. There's so much distractions in our lives. Our mobile phones won't let us forget it's there. Every day it's pinging off something, right? Some of us have, have those notifications from your Facebook and Google and whatever else, uh, all kinds of notifications. Have you ever been on a lunch with somebody and they're constantly on their phone? It's like, man, you're so distracted. It's, it's, it's almost rude. And, and that's why I, I usually turn off my phone notifications, right? Most of you don't, see, don't hear things pinging off on me because I turn it off. I decide when I check my notifications. And so if you're wondering why, Pastor Wilson, I ping you. Why didn't you respond to me in five minutes? That's because it's off. I'll check it when it's time. I have some time. And so uh, when God comes knocking... He seeks our undivided attention. Are we there, ready for Him? Are we, are we willing to commit to give God attention? Because God is wanting to knock at the door of our hearts because He seeks our attention. Are we ready to give Him that attention? Perhaps this convention that's coming, God may just want to knock at the door of your heart. Will you be there? Now, the second thing, the second thing we can learn from this passage is that God seeks to reveal himself to us. Think about that. When you look at verse 1 again, all the way to verse 4, and the prophet Isaiah saw in there, I saw the Lord seated on a throne high and exalted, and the train of his robe, he had a very long train, the train of his robe filled the whole temple, and above him were seraphs, each with six wings. There's some form of angels. With two wings, they cover their faces. Two, they cover their feet. And two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole world is, is full of His glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook. And the temple was filled with smoke. And so here we see the prophet Isaiah. He had this incredible vision where he saw God in this um, incredible encounter. And can you just imagine? I mean, he's, he's in this vision, and he sees the very throne of God, and the glory of God just shining forth, and his eyes is up there, and around it were these incredible creatures that's around. And the Bible doesn't describe how many they are, but they are named seraphs. And, uh, and, and in, that, in that whole vision, it's just revealing something about who God is and what He is. There's this incredible revelation that Isaiah is, is receiving at that very point. He's seeing the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the Almighty One, the most glorious and splendorous of all. He's seeing all of this just in that vision. As part of vision, you realize, it describes about his, his, God has a robe. And this rope was filling the entire temple that he saw in the vision. And you know, in the olden days, well, even until today though, uh, when, when you have someone of, of majesty and they wear this powerful looking rope, and the rope has a, a train, right? And, and what it, it does is the longer the train is, the longer the rope is, it shows the higher the status of a person. 
how more majestic they may be or superior and, and so forth. When in 1953, June the 3rd, millions and millions of people watched the inauguration of Queen Elizabeth II. And right now on the screen, I think you can see uh, the picture of her robe. When she walked up to her uh, coronation, they, they needed six ladies in waiting just to hold her robe because it was so heavy, the train of the robe, to help her walk. And it was just an incredible thing. Uh, the train of a rope is 18 feet long, almost 6 meters. And so that was amazing. But tell you what, the, the train of Queen Elizabeth's rope is nothing compared to the train that Isaiah saw of God that filled the entire immense temple. It's just incredible. And so it really it was meant to signify the greatness, the incredible greatness of God's majesty. So there's some revelation to Isaiah. And then think about the angelic seraphs. They're fiery seraphs. And because in the Hebrew, the word seraphs is derived from Hebrew word meaning burn. So there were some burning angelic angels which are incredible because they had six wings. And here they are. Uh, and they began to cry out in awe and reverence unto God, and they were saying, holy, and the holy, when they cried out holy, it's like shockwave, boom, because see, the whole threshold, the doors of the post where he was, everything shook, the angels just said, holy, and everything shook, and we'd be like having an earthquake right here if the angels were saying that right here, and so it just showed that what an incredible scene that Isaiah was having at that time, wow, and all of this was to give Isaiah a revelation about who God is and what God is. It's just an incredible vision that they had. Have you ever thought about this? We cannot know God by our own means. We cannot discover God by our own efforts. We cannot find God out. We cannot do some scientific experiments, put up some special uh, lens and, and begin to look into heaven and discover God. We can't do any of these things. And that is why God has to reveal himself. And God does. God has chosen to reveal himself. And he's revealed himself to grant us a deeper revelation of God. God says, I want to reveal myself to you so that you can know something more about me. So God reveals himself so that we can discover who he is and what he is. Wow. And the reason why God does this is not just to say, hey, look at us, this incredible display of who I am. God does this because he actually wants to connect with you. Can you tell neighbor, God wants to connect with you. God wants to connect with you. God wants to get you to connect with him. God wants you to get to know him just as he already knows you. So think about this. When you look through the scriptures, you find that God even called Abraham and Moses friends. You can look it up in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 7, and uh, Exodus chapter 33, verse 11. And even Jesus, Jesus called the disciples his friends. In the book of John, it says here, chapter 15, verse 14 to 15, this is what Jesus said. You are my friends. If you do what I command, I no longer call you servants because the servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Do you notice something about the very nature of this friendship that Jesus talked about? The nature of the friendship that God actually seeks. You see, Jesus explained that the very basis, the basis for friendship with God is trustworthiness. The kind of trustworthiness that is demonstrated by our obedience. And so, we can become trustworthy friends with God. If you understand this, then you can begin to grow and develop in that friendship, actually, with God. Now, we need to understand a few things. One is, the Bible does reveal God to us. And that's why it's so important you read your Bible. Because you, 
One, if you want to know more of God, you got to read your Bible. So the Bible tells us a lot about God, who He is, what He is, how He operates, what, what is on His heart, that sort of matter. But what the Bible gives is information. The Bible gives us knowledge. It is not an intimate knowing. Uh, the kind of friendship that God actually desires to have with us. How do you get to know someone? It takes time. It takes us having conversations. It takes us doing things with them. It takes us having to be with them and, and all those different things that happen so that we, we hear their hearts, we hear their values, we see them in action, we see how they make decisions. That's how we really get to know somebody. So it takes time. It takes spending time with them. And you know, you cannot get to know somebody who sits down beside you and, and give you a download of information. This is where I was born, this is how I was born, this is, this is what I eat, this is what I like to eat, this is where I, I went for holidays. And they just boo, 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 and sit you down for the next 12 hours and tell you everything about their life. And you come out of it and you're like, sure, I know a lot about you now, but I still don't know you. Because we need to spend time with them. And so the Bible, which is incredibly important and helpful to us, tells us a lot about God and His ways and His dealings with the people of God. But if you want to know God, you actually got to spend time with Him. Now, of course, God is a little bit more different because He's spirit, so it's not actually visible. And God operates at a whole totally different level from us. But the fundamentals are still the same. If you want to have a re relationship, an intimate relationship with God, you have to actually spend time with Him. Time in prayer. Time in walking with Him. Time in listening to Him. Time in obeying what He's telling you to do and things like this. And as you journey with God and you see how God interacts with you along the way, that's how you actually get to know God much better in a personal way. How many say amen to that? Amen. God wants to reveal Himself to us, not just in a one-way fashion, but God actually wants to foster a relationship with each and every one of us. Intimacy with God requires personal time with God. And so when God comes knocking, He seeks to reveal more of Himself. Will we take the time to allow Him to do so and get to know Him? God is wanting to knock. And He may be knocking already in many of our doors, but are we there to open the door and say, come on in? Third thing I want to share today is that God seeks us to approach Him. When you look at verse 5 to 7 of this vision, He went on to say, woe unto me. You see, Isaiah has seen this incredible vision and all this immense thing happening. And then something happened. He said, woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongues uh, with tongues from the altar. And with it, he touched my mouth and said, This, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. You know, I don't know about you. Can you imagine how it is when, when Isaiah was seeing this incredible vision and he's seeing God in, in all his glory at that moment in time. And then those fiery, those my seraphs, and, uh, and, and when, when he saw those angels, it must be both mesmerizing, but also terrifying at the same time. This incredible, fiery angels with six wings. I mean, whew, that kind of thing was happening. And then these angels were just crying, holy, holy, and holy, and, and the temple was shaking and all these things. Can you just imagine these guys like, oh, you know, it's just totally, totally overwhelmed. And then the very presence of God, the holiness of God probably, the, the very holy presence of God just like pierced his very soul. And it's like, whoa, the holiness of God is, and suddenly he is so aware of the, his own sinfulness, his own wretchedness, and it suddenly dawned upon him, man, 
I mean, he, you must recognize he's the prophet, the man who speaks the word, the very words of God. And Isaiah is not just some ordinary prophet. He's one of those greatest prophets in the, in the Bible. And he suddenly realized, oh, my lips, the way I speak, the, oh, my goodness, I have not been so pure. I, I've said things I shouldn't have said. And I live among people who are, oh, my goodness. And it it's suddenly dawned upon him how sinful he is. He was filled with guilt and dread. But immediately, this is what is amazing, immediately, one of the seraphs flew to the altar and with tongues grabbed, notice tongues. I mean, this is an angel, an angel, a fiery angel. He could have taken maybe the fiery coal with his hands, but no, he, he actually had a metal tongue. He took that and he flew all the way immediately to Isaiah, who said, ah, oh, my lips, I'm a man of uncleanness. And the guy says, put his burning tongue of fire, of coal, and put it on Isaiah's lips. My, I don't know about you, but I'm like, ah. <laughs> you know, oh my goodness. Uh, worse than being cauterized or something, you know. But he did that. The angel did just that. And the angel said, see, your sin has been taken away. Your guilt has been taken away, sorry. Your sin has been covered. And that's just incredible. You see, God provided a way to cover over our inadequacies, our sinfulness. Why? So that we can approach God. Just as Isaiah can now approach God. Remember, we we cannot approach God by our own merits because we're too sinful. We cannot. There's no way we can approach God because of the sin that so fill our hearts that if we ever approach the glory of God, the the sin will just burn us and we, we will die in agony because we can't take it. That's why God said to Moses, you can't see me face to face. You could only see the after passing of my glory. And so we cannot do that, but God says, now I will provide a way. Of course, that's through Jesus Christ. Through his blood, we can now enter in. You know, these angelic visitations are really incredible. I, I know a friend many years ago when she was just a brand new believer, and she was a housewife, and she had an amazing encounter when an angel appeared to her in her house. And she told us, when the angel appeared, she was like, oh, she just collapsed the floor because her body couldn't cope with the very presence of this angel. I, I read another story of a famous prophet, and he had an angel visit him. And he said the presence of the angel was so overwhelming that at the end of that brief conversation that the angel spoke some things to him, he he made one very special request to the angel. He said, please, please don't ever visit me again. Because he he was so overwhelming, he couldn't cope. He said, I felt I was going to die in the very presence of this angel. And that's just an angel. Imagine when he's God. That's why I was saying our sins, we we just burn up and and die because the holiness of God is just too much for any of us. And so we cannot approach God by our own merits. And Jesus' blood must cover over our sins. Only then we can begin to approach God with a humble confidence. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3, Uh, Verse 11 and verse 12. It says, Christ Jesus our Lord, in Him and through Him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Can somebody say amen? Amen. It's through Jesus Christ that we can do so. So God has now turned our sinful cringe before the presence of God to humble confidence so that we may approach Him. And God has done everything possible to make that happen. And now God is extending an invitation to us. And God is saying, come, child. The door is now open. Come into my very presence, into my very throne room. God has done all of that for us. The question is, are we going to take up that offer, that invitation of God? You know, that's why one of the things, whenever I sense the presence of God, one of the things I think about is God, Are you wanting me to approach you now? Are you wanting me to come in more? Is there a reason why you're knocking at the door of my heart right now? 
And that's something we should ask ourselves. Because maybe God has just put out an invitation for you to come closer to Him. But if we are not aware, if we're not understanding, and we, we just say, oh, what's that? Whew, and we walk away. Or we get distracted by another phone call or something else. But if we say, whoa, 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 okay, put aside, shut everything. Man, cancel all the meetings. I don't care if it's the CEO. I don't care if it's the prime minister. Shut all the meetings. God is here. And I want to spend some time with him. Can somebody say amen? Amen. God, when he comes knocking, he seeks to have us approach him. Come. Let's enter in. Now, the fourth and last key I want to share with us is that God seeks our willing response to him. In verse uh, 2 to 4 again, and, uh, and, and to verse 8, again, in verse 2 to 4, is about the angels that we spoke just now. And, and you can see the picture there, an angel with six wings. And the angel that covered themselves. And then in verse 8, it says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who will go for us? And I say, Here am I, send me. So here, Isaiah, he, he saw those angels who were serving God around his throne. And this angel had six wings as you saw in the picture just now. And with one set of wings, it was covering his, their faces. And this is a way to show a reverence. The angels were showing reverence to God. That's why they were covering their faces. And with two wings, they were covering their feet because this was a show of modesty. We're serving the Lord. We're in God's presence in modesty. And with two wings, they were flying ready to serve the Lord, just like the angel when Isaiah cried out, woe unto me, immediately the angel probably heard something from God. God says, help this guy. And the angel flew, Phew! immediately respond to God. These angels were crying out the praise and worship unto God. They were attentive. They were in reverence. They were in devotion unto God. And so Isaiah saw all of this, the angels serving God in that way. And then God spoke. And God said this, who will go for us? Now think about this. Who is God speaking to? That's only Isaiah. Who else had this vision? It's like God saying, hey, who is going to do this for us? That's only Isaiah. God is only speaking to Isaiah. But God did not say, Isaiah, I want you to do this. But God said, who will do this? Why? Because God did not want to demand from Isaiah. God is asking, are you available? Are you willing? And Isaiah responded immediately. He says, here am I. I, I I'll go. I'll, I'll do it, God. I, I'm excited. I'm willing. I'm ready. I'm available, God. I'm here. I'll go. Wow. His response was immediate. He too, as he saw the example of the angels serving God, he too said, yeah, man, I want to serve God like this too. The question is, what about us? Are we willing to respond to God? Should God come knocking at our door? Will we follow the examples of the seraphs of Isaiah itself? You know, as I've looked back in different points of my own life, there are points when I was in the very presence of God, and I got down in my heart before God. I say, God, I'm available. I'm ready. And that's when God began to speak to me about different things. Because I came with willing hearts. If we come with willing hearts, God says, I'm going to come. I'm going to speak to you. You see, God loves to speak to those whose hearts are soft and responsive to Him. How many of you would like to be on God's visiting schedule? God says, Louis, I've got you on my visiting schedule. I'm going to come today. Maybe David Tan. God might be saying, I've got you on my schedule. I'm going to come today. Maybe for some of different ones of us, do we want to be on God's visiting schedule? Well, let our hearts be soft and responsive to Him. And you might be surprised when God says, I've got you. I'm coming. I'm going to knock at the door of your hearts. When God comes knocking, He seeks our willing response. Let's respond with faith. Let's respond with willing hearts. You know, Jesus said in the book of Revelations, 
And whenever God speaks in the book of Revelation, we better pay attention because it is the last book. In chapter 3, verse 20, Jesus says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Wow. And eat with him and he with me. Are we going to open our doors wide, invite Jesus, not only into our lounge room, but into our dining room? Will we invite Jesus into every part of our house, the bedrooms, the kitchen? Will we ask Jesus, please stay longer so that I can get to know you more? Because I love to have you in my very home. God is wanting to come knocking. Will we be ready to receive Him? Will we be interested to become His trustworthy friend?